Sin fractured everything. And it left us shattered and broken. But no matter how distant or silent God may seem, He's still faithfully using broken people. To accomplish his flawless plans. Sin fractured everything. And it left us shattered and broken. But no matter how distant or silent God may seem, He's still faithfully using broken people. to accomplish his flawless plans. All right, if you got a Bible, grab it, open it, turn it on, follow along on screen, in your outline, or use the Central Church app. Um, Esther chapter 3 is where we're going to start today. We're going to wind up in Esther chapter 8. Um, we're not going 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. We're going to start in 3, and then we'll wind up in 8. This is week number 3 um, of our series called Shattered. We've been going through the book of Esther, and we've been talking about how we're a fractured people, um, that we all have broken lives, and, and there are pieces in our lives that God is putting back together because he is the flawless God. So fractured people, flawless God, and this may be where we wrap up. I'm not sure. Um, we we may go one more week next week. Um, I have an idea for what I want to do next week, but I might use that later on in the summertime. Um, so next week might be a one-off message until we jump into um, our next series. Um, today, though, I want to start off by a question because today we're going to talk about we're really going to talk about who we are in Christ and understanding what God wants out of us and, and, and how God literally is picking up the pieces. And, and he doesn't want us looking at these fractured pieces and, and seeing our lives all, all broken and shattered, but knowing again that he is in control and he's, he's picking them up. And piece by piece, he's, he's putting us where we need to go. We're going to talk about the curse that happened um, over, over the, um, the Jewish people in Esther's time. We're going to talk about how the curse was spoken over them and how for far too many of us believe curses that have been spoken to us and about us for far too long in our lives. And so I'm going to start out by asking a question to kind of get the mood set a little bit light. It's not really a question like when you ask something and you really know the answer because I know the answer to this, but um, have, you, have you ever said something to someone and as soon as it left your mouth, you wish you could take it back. Like as soon as that phrase, that word, that question, that statement came out, you, 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 you just wish, anybody? Anybody that's you? Because you knew that what just came out of you wasn't what you meant to say, but it was going to be used against you for probably the rest of your life, right? Like uh, anyone? Like for example, um, when Mary and I were dating, and this is like 23 years ago, so you'll see how, how scarred I got by this. Um, anyway, we were dating. I went to pick her up for this date. And she looked different. Like, like, she looked really great, but her hair looked different. Now, follow along. What I wanted to say was, your hair looks nice. Because that's what I've been taught to say. Be polite, you know, make good compliments. And so, your hair looks nice is what I fully intended to say. What came out of my mouth was, what happened to your hair? Your hair looks nice, and what happened to your hair are two totally different statements. Right, ladies? 
Some of you are like, you should be killed. You should have been killed, like on the spot. I probably was close. I, I, I was. Because as soon as I, I looked at her, I saw the look on her face and like the tear in her eye. I was like, what I meant to say was, and she's like, it's too late. Like what, what you meant to say already came out of your mouth. And, and that, was, that was true, I guess. And all of us, all of us, all of us, all of us have, have, have said something to someone, like a, a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, a spouse, a kid, a friend, or whatever. And as soon as we say said it, we wish we could take it back, right? On the flip side, every single person here today, I don't care what your background is, everybody here has had something said to you that hurts you. You had something said to you by somebody that you cared about or somebody that you still care about and it hurts you. And one of the biggest lies that we learn from the time that we're kids is that sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words will never, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and be honest with some of the stuff in my life that has been said to me and about me, I would have much rather had the sticks and the stones because the pain associated with sticks and stones is temporary, right? You can heal from that, but I don't know about you, I can still remember stuff that was said to me and about me in kindergarten, and that stuff, it hurts, that's stuff that stays with us for a long time, and, and, and there, are, there are some people here today, you, you've never been physically abused but verbally, you've been beaten for years. And we get beaten by the words of others from all kinds of different sources. For instance, social media. Man, isn't that crazy? Like, I'm not the anti-social media guy, but if you go down the rabbit hole of social media and let people that don't even know you tell you how bad of a person you are or how awful you do things or how wrong you are, that, that's like, man, you just take a beating every time you open up your phone, every time you log on. You take a beating every time you walk into that situation. There's all kinds of places and all kinds of areas where we get verbally beat on. And one of the last places that we would ever expect to get beat is church. But, but don't you, haven't you ever felt like that? Not, not at this church, I'm just saying hypothetically, right? Like, like for me, I remember going to churches growing up and, and just all the time, like the, the, the message was always just like, you suck, do more, go home and come back next week. If you have fixed everything that you're dealing with, if you haven't fixed it, then you can't come back because you're not good enough and you're not godly enough. And you can't be one of us if you can't act like us and you can't act right. And so eventually I got tired of that because I felt like I got beat up every single week. But then as I began to really read the Bible and discover the Gospels and really what the Scriptures say, that that's not God's heart for us. God's heart for us is a blessing, not a beating. Listen, God doesn't want his children to get beat up every week, and he doesn't want you and I to let people who don't even know us to define us. He doesn't want, he, he, he doesn't want to speak curses over you. That, that's, that's the point here. God doesn't want to speak curses over you like other people have. He actually wants us to walk in his blessing and in his favor. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today in the book of Esther. Because here's what I know. We've used this illustration every single week. The puzzle pieces, right? The, the picture on the box, this is what we want our life to look like. We want, we want, we want everything to be perfect. And we want people to see this. This is what we want people to see. Knowing the inside, we're broken. We get that. We understand that. We've talked about that every week. We're broken. We know the pieces are going to fall out, and they're going to make a great big mess. It's going to be crazy. But we want to look like this. But then the words that people speak slowly began to let it pour out. Here, here's what I want to let you know, though, too, this morning as we do this. I haven't done this in any other services. But I want to let you know. But you're not alone, because everybody sitting around you is broken and messed up too. And all of us feel like we're in pieces. How many of you got high anxiety right now? <laughs> Wait till Trevor's got to separate this out. <laughs> I'm way off on time. This message is way messed up, crazy today anyway. But, but here, here, here's what we, we need to understand. All of us feel like this, right? We want to feel like this. We want to be, we want to have the picture for every life, but, but, we're, but we feel like this. And the important thing you need to know when we get to the end of this message today is that we're in it together. All of us are in this together. 
And if you want to be a part of what we're doing here at Central, you need to understand that we're doing it together. We're stepping into being who God has called us to be, and we're stepping into this world together. And so if you're hurting, if there are things going on, man, you're not alone. We're, we're, we're in this with each other. And so today we're going to really talk about speaking encouragement into each other so we can get past the pieces of our lives that have been torn apart by the curses spoken over us. Real quick recap of where we're at in Esther. Esther and Mordecai, the story starts out, they're taken captive from Jerusalem and they're moved over to Persia and their lives completely fell apart. They're enslaved. Then there comes the king. King's name is Xerxes. Um, Xerxes is married to um, a woman named Vasti and and he wants her to come naked before him wearing just the crown and she won't do it. She says no. So he banishes her. And then he's like, oh my gosh, I don't have a wife. And then his people come together and they're like, hey, we got an idea. Let's form a harem and you can sleep with a different girl every single night. And the one that pleases you the most, she gets to be the queen. He's like, sweet. That's a great, because he's completely pagan. All right. He's like, that's, that's a great idea. And so he goes through the process and he winds up with Esther. And in the church, the thing we never really talk about is Esther was a sex slave. And she has a book of the Bible named after her. That's crazy how God can take everything and use it for his good and his glory. Somehow he picks up the pieces and he puts them back together in his time, in his way, not ours. Blows my mind. And so that's Esther and Mordecai and Xerxes. And then the really bad guy in the story, his name is Haman. And Haman wanted to kill all the Jewish people because he couldn't stand Mordecai. And Mordecai and Esther are Jewish, but they hadn't told the king. And so Haman has the king issue a decree that all the Jews are to be killed. And Mordecai goes to Esther and says, Esther, we're Jews, but we're not telling the king. And, and Haman doesn't know, and nobody really knows. And he says, hey, if he does this, we're going to be killed. Like, like Esther, you're going to be killed. And you, you've got to put a stop to this because you're the queen. And she's like, I know I'm the queen, but I can't go before the king. Because if you go before the king and he hasn't summoned you, then he will kill you. And he hasn't even been interested in me in 30 days. And Mordecai was like, hey, maybe the reason that you're queen Maybe the reason that our lives are in pieces and, and maybe the reason you've gone through everything was God has put you in a position for such a time as this. And so Esther says, you know what? I'll go. And she says, if I die, I die. And she goes in front of the king and the king welcomes her into his presence. And then last week we talked about how she prepared a banquet because she wanted to tell the king what was going on, but she didn't tell him at the first banquet. She said, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you what I want later. Come back tomorrow to another banquet. And when we said there's wisdom and the way that Esther approached the king in the situation. And at the end of the day, we found out that wisdom allowed her to walk in freedom. And we, when we saw how God completely took care of Esther and Mordecai, how behind the scenes he really was picking up the pieces, putting them back together. And then we saw that bitterness is what ultimately led to the death of, of Haman. Well, that's where we pick up the story today. There's still a problem, though. This problem was established early in the story in, in um, chapter 1, verse 19, after, after, um, after Xerxes had banished Vasti or um, going through all of that. It said this, as guys had come together and said, so if it pleases the king, we suggest you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians, the Medes, that cannot be revoked. Remember we said every single week, we said in that time period, once a law, once, once this law was on the books, it couldn't be what? Couldn't be removed, right? Couldn't be revoked. It just couldn't. Once a law was a law, you couldn't remove the law. Um, once, it was, once it was said, it was done. And, and by the way, just to insert this here, the words that have been said to you and the words that have been said about you, they don't magically go away either, do they? They don't just get removed. They don't just disappear. Have you ever had somebody say to you, hey, you shouldn't let that bother you. They're just words. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, Really? Let me kick you in the face and tell you that shouldn't bother you. Just kick in the face, right? I mean, things that get said to us are always going to bother us, especially when they're said about us and they can't be undone. I wish to God I could unhear and unread some of the stuff that I've heard and read, but I can't. How about you? So, so with that in mind, 
that, that it can't be revoked. Keep this in mind. This was the law that Haman had the king passed about the Jewish people. This is chapter 3, verse 12. So on April 17th, the king's secretaries were summoned, and the decree was written exactly as Haman dictated. It was sent to the king's highest officers, the governors of the respective provinces, and the nobles of each province in their own scripts and language. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. Everyone listened to Xerxes back then. Like he reigned over everything. Dispatchers were sent by swift messengers into all the provinces of the empire. Now watch this. Imagine you're a Jewish person in this time period and this happens. And the empire giving the order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. This was scheduled to happen on March 7th of the next year. The property of the Jews would be given to those who killed them. Imagine that. Imagine the weight that you would have to carry if you were Jewish and this was issued. How would you feel? Would you feel broken? Would you feel like your life had just fallen into a bunch of pieces? Would you feel cursed? Like, I, I, would, I would feel cursed. This was a curse spoken over the Jewish people. This, this, don't, don't miss this. This was a curse spoken over God's chosen people. And there are probably people in this room, and I need to say this, that you've been carrying a curse that was spoken over you, to you, and about you for far too long. The Bible says in Proverbs, the power of life and death is in the tongue. And, and there are people that, that we're like walking wounded just because of what's been said. In fact, I think, I think way too many followers of Jesus carry the weight of the curse. I do. I think way too many followers of Jesus carry the weight of the curse. And the weight of the curse crushes us. And, and we, feel like, we feel like our life is in pieces because of what's been said to us and about us. And we begin to feel like this phrase right here, and, I, and we've talked about this, this phrase before, but it's, I'm not blank enough. Right? Remember I was talking about that? You can fill in that blank with just about anything. I'm not blank enough. That's how we feel about ourselves. And some of us, some of us, we don't even actually have to hear the curse from someone else. We don't have to fill in the blank from someone else. Some of us, the curse is the voices in our head. Some of us, nobody really has to beat us up. Satan started the process many years ago, and we ourselves... Negative self-talk to ourselves all the time. Talk down to ourselves all the time simply because we think it's normal. Like, 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 like let's go through some of these. We can make a huge list here, but let's talk about some stuff. I'll start out with one, one that I struggle with um, from time to time. It's this. I'm not smart enough. So, somebody said to me this week, um, <laughs> true story, like, Pastor Ryan, you're so smart. And I laughed out loud. Because I've never, ever considered myself smart. I was at a conference years ago, and one of, the, one of the speakers, and I felt like he was looking right at me when he said it. He wasn't, but I felt like it. He said, if you're ever the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I was like, sweet. I will never be in the wrong room ever because I'm an idiot. See, that's how you feel when you're in the fourth grade and a teacher calls you stupid. True story. When I was in elementary school, the teachers could actually call you stupid and get away with it. Today they would get fired, right? KCCI would come up, do a great big story about it. It'd be crazy. But back then, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, you could get called stupid by the teacher. And when that happens, you really don't feel smart about anything. How about this one? I'm not pretty enough. I know a lot of women and men who deal with this. I'm not pretty enough. So we go out. We buy the product, or we buy the treadmill, or we get the gym membership, or we get whatever, and it doesn't work, it doesn't transform us, it doesn't make us into who we think the world is calling us to be and saying that we should be. And because of that, we feel like we're never enough. Or we're in church and we come to a place where, where we feel like we're walking with Jesus and we, we get to a spot where we think, hey, I'm not godly enough. You ever felt like that? You ever felt like you're okay in your walk with Jesus and you meet somebody else and that somebody else sees what you're doing and they point out what you're doing and, and, and they tell you that, hey, you're not following Jesus right. You're not going to the right group. You're not sitting in the right chair. You don't have the right Bible. You're not doing this. You're just screwing up. You're, I'm not talking about sin. Like, this, this is different when somebody's pointing out sin and correcting you in love, right? Like, like, like that's, that's different. I'm talking about somebody telling you stuff that isn't true. It has nothing to do with the Bible and makes you feel like you're just constantly screwing up. They're just beating you down with the curses they're speaking over you, making you feel like I'm not good enough. 
There are way too many people here today that these are the lives that you believe about you. The curses spoken to us and over us by the enemy. And listen to me, it is not God's will that you and I walk under the curse of the enemy. Listen, don't miss that. It's not God's will. It's not God's will for you and I to walk under the curse of the enemy. It's not his will. Because Esther, like, like think about what Esther does. We saw last week she did the right thing. She went in front of the king, but it's still the problem. The, the, the law, the Medes and the Persians, we just read that, it's still intact, still in order. So they got to do something about it. So in chapter 8, verse 3, we see, Then Esther went again before the king. Now I want to point something out here before I get really deep into this. We talked about in week one, the very first time that Esther went in front of the king, did, did she want to do it, yes or no? No, the answer is no, because she was worried she'd be killed, right? She was scared. She was timid. But here we see her walk in this thing called confidence. We'll talk about that in a second. Esther went before the king, falling at his feet and begging him with tears to stop the evil plot devised by Haman the Agite against the Jews. Again, the king held out the golden scepter to Esther. She rose and stood before him. I love, love, love the fact that at the beginning of this story, Esther is scared. But now she's walking in confidence See, at the beginning of the story, Esther's hiding the fact that she's Jewish because the curse that was issued was spoken over all of the Jews, spoken over God's chosen people. And so the curse was actually spoken over her. But at this point in the story, we see Esther saying in her own heart, I will not allow the curse to steal my confidence. And that's one of the things that I think that we as followers of Jesus Christ have got to learn that we will not allow the curse that others speak against us to steal the confidence that we are in Christ. I think there are too many times that we, I'm, this is me, me personally, we have let the curse steal our confidence that we are children of God. We belong to him. We don't belong to the opinions of other people discussing something on the internet or talking about us behind our back. The people who know absolutely nothing about you, they haven't walked in your shoes how can we let them talk about us? They haven't lived your story. They haven't gone through the hell that you've gone through. They don't know the price you've paid. At the end of the day, don't you dare let somebody steal the confidence that God is speaking into you by allowing them to speak curses over you. If we let that happen, we believe they're curses over God's confidence. Man, I hope this is something we can all wrap our minds around because I've been getting, getting convicted about this myself all week long because we let what other people think about us determine our behavior. Don't we? Don't we do that? Well, what will other people think if I do that? Like, like seriously, who cares? Like who flipping cares? Listen, if somebody is constantly speaking curses over you, again, not correction, not pointing out sin in your life, not telling you, hey, you're having an affair, you need to knock it off. Hey, you're, 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 you're doing drugs, you need to knock it off. You're, you're doing this, like, I'm not talking about sin. I am not talking about sin. I'm talking about the stuff that isn't true. People speaking down on you, trying to pull you back in and break your lives into pieces. Those people, listen to me, you need to walk away from them. You need to walk away. Far too long, we've listened to the curses of other people. And we've allowed that to determine how we're walking with God and how we're taking our steps forward. And for many of you, you're afraid to take your next steps because you're afraid of what somebody else is going to say. Who cares? Who cares? You need to care about what God says. Amen? Verse 5. Esther said, if it pleases the king, notice she's still appealing to him. She's still going with that. If it pleases the king and I have found favor with him, and if he thinks it is right and I am pleased in him, let there be a decree that reverses the order of Haman, son of Hamadath the Agite, who ordered the Jews throughout all the king's provinces should be destroyed. For how could I endure to see my people and my family slaughtered and destroyed? In other words, Esther's like, we've got to reverse the curse. I know we can't remove the curse. We can't unsay it. We can't unhear it, but we can reverse the curse. And I, I love this. I love, I love, I love, I love that Esther doesn't want this for just her. I mean, she could have. She could have played that card. She could have been like, hey, King, here's the deal. I'm Jewish, and I know you like me, and so I know you want to keep me. And so if you keep me and Mordecai and maybe a couple of my friends, just kind of pull them in, everybody else, 
just let them die. Like, no, 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 she doesn't do that. She understands it's not just her life in pieces. There are other people around her that they're in it together. And so she has a heart for other people. And we talked about last week, that's how you know you're connected with Jesus. And when you, when you realize, hey, I'm not doing life alone and I actually have a heart for other people. And you don't wanna spend your time speaking negativity over their lives. You wanna help them pick up the pieces and you wanna help them sort it out. And you wanna get your life sorted and their life sorted and this person's life sorted. And, and we all want to work together towards the same goal. You wanna encourage and build each other up. Listen to me, if you don't hear anything else I have to say today, you need to hear this. Don't allow negativity to hijack your mindset. Don't allow negativity to hijack your mindset. Your mindset belongs to you. And if you allow negativity to hijack your mindset, you have no one to blame except for you. I'm gonna preach a whole message, probably a message series on this, this summer about renewing our mind. We'll talk about that a lot then, but it's important. But today you need to understand we need to stop and we need to not allow negativity to hijack our mindset. And we need to remember we're in this thing together. Verse seven, and then King Xerxes said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, I've given Esther the property of Haman and he has been impaled on a pole because he tried to destroy the Jews. Watch this. Now go ahead and send a messenger to the Jews in the king's name telling them that whatever you want, seal it with the king's signet ring. In other words, just, just go do it. Just go do what you want. But remember that what has ever already been written in the king's name and sealed with a signet ring cannot be revoked. In other words, you can't unhear. You can't unread something that's been said about you. So how do you do it? How do you do it? Well, just like Esther and Mordecai we talked about last week are walking in, were walking in wisdom last week, they're going to walk in wisdom here. Watch what they do. This is so brilliant. We need, we need this in our society today. We need this in our churches today, seriously. Because they didn't try to undo anything. Because once again, none of us, we can't undo what's been said. We can't undo what's been heard. But watch what they did. Verse nine, on June 25th, the king's secretaries were summoned and a decree was written exactly as Mordecai dictated. It was sent to the Jews and to the highest officers, the governors and the nobles of all 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. So that's a big empire. That, that's huge. And Xerxes is in charge of everything. Everybody feared Xerxes and all of this entire empire. The decree was written in the scripts and languages of all the people of the empire, including that of the Jews, because the Jews are the people who were under the curse. Now watch what happens. Verse 10. This is great. The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes, who, by the way, this is a side note here. In that culture, in that society, in that empire, King Xerxes was considered to be the name above every name. Now, isn't that interesting? Because all of us know somebody who has the name above every name. And what he, really, what he says really does matter. Amen? The decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. The name of Jesus, his words are sealed with a blood-stained cross and an empty tomb. I mean, he's just better than everything, Right? Mordecai sent the dispatchers by swift messengers who rode fast horses, especially bread, for the king's service. Now watch this. The king decreed and gave the Jews in every city authority to unite. Everyone say unite. 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 Come together. Unite and defend themselves. In other words, they say, hey, it's time to come together. And I think that's what the body of Christ needs to do in society today is come together. Again, realize we're not in this alone. We're not broken alone. Because while the world is speaking negativity, the church can speak the name that is above every name. The name of, the name of, the name of, the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. So they were allowed to kill, slaughter, and annihilate any one of any nationality or province who might attack them or their children and wives and to take the property of their enemies. And so this was the message. We can't undo what's been said about you. But if you guys will come together and unite, if you come together and unite, you're stronger. You're stronger. You're stronger than those who will come against you. And if we, if we would come together as a church and unite, we're so much stronger than the negativity of the world that's been spoken to you. What would happen? Well, just, just a thought. 
what would happen if you texted three people? What would happen if you texted three people in the next hour and just said, listen, I haven't told you lately, but I love you, and here's why. Would that make a difference in somebody's life, yes or no? Absolutely. What if you sent somebody an email? L listen, it doesn't have to be a book, just a short email. I just want to let you know, hey, I'm thankful for you, and I'm thankful for all you've done. I'm thankful for your family, and I love you, and this is why. What if you did that? What if you did that? I, I, I was thinking about this. This wasn't even a part of the message until this week. I got, I got a message on Tuesday, an email from someone. It was absolutely encouraging. Just made my day. Ch changed my entire day and my outlook for the week. And, and, and really became part of this message of understanding what would it be like if we did that? What would it be like if we encouraged each other all the time? Again, if we realize I'm not in this alone, I'm not in pieces alone, there are other people around me that are in the same situation. What if we became encouragers and not cursers? And I know some people are thinking, I don't, I don't have anybody to encourage me. Well, if you're not getting it, go ahead and give it because sometimes you've got to give it to get it. And listen, I'm not talking about money. All right, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not going health and wealth. I'll, I'll never go there. If I do, please make sure you push me out the side door or something. I'm just saying if you want to be, if you want encouragement, be an encourager. Because I, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, if you're, listen, if I'm talking about what if you encourage three people today, what if you let three people know that you love them and people are popping into your mind, let me help you with something. That's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart. Don't procrastinate that. Go ahead and tell them. I freaking love you, man. You're, you're awesome. And tell them why. Because what, what happens when we come together and we use our ability to encourage each other, that's the love of Jesus. And that's what Jesus talks about when he says, hey, they will know you are my followers by the way you what? By the way you love one another, right? So let's unite and be encouragers. Let's help each other to pick up the pieces. Amen? Verse 12. The day chosen for this event was throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes was March 7th of the next year. A copy of this decree was to be issued as law in every province and proclaimed to all the peoples so that the Jews would be ready to take revenge of their enemies on the appointed days. In other words, they felt like this had gone to this, right? They felt like the picture-perfect life had fallen apart. But all of a sudden, the pieces start coming back together. The pieces are put in place. God's hand is all over this, taking care of his people because they had been crushed by the enemy, but they were blessed by the king. Don't miss that. Been crushed by the enemy, but they're blessed by the king because that's me and you. We've been cursed by the enemy, but we've been blessed by the king. And, and then watch what happens. Verse 14. So urged on by the king's command, the messengers rode out swiftly on fast horses. That's the second time fast horses was mentioned. And ironically, we're talking about this on Kentucky Derby weekend. <laughs> it's crazy though. It's crazy that it says it twice. Because what it shows us is this, this encouraging message has to get out as quickly as possible. We can't wait. We can't wait. We can't just watch somebody. We, we've got to step in and we've got to talk and we've got to talk encouragement. Bread for the king's service, the same decree was also proclaimed in the fortress of Susa. Then Mordecai left the king's presence wearing the royal robe of blue and white, the great crown of gold, and an outer cloak of fine linen and purple. Mordecai was on fleek. Did we still say that? I don't, I don't know. And the people of Susa celebrated the new decree. In other words, they're getting excited about it. That's key. They're excited. The Jews were filled with joy and gladness and were honored everywhere. That should describe people who belong to Jesus. Filled with joy and gladness. Not filled with anger and madness, right? Joy and gladness. That's what we should be known for. Joy and gladness. Listen, if you are a follower of Jesus, at the end of the story, no matter how jacked up your story might be, no matter how many pieces you might be holding, you win because you're on team Jesus. And that's something to celebrate. Amen? Celebrating in this story. In every province and city, wherever the king's decree arrived, the Jews rejoiced and a great celebration. That's what our church services should be every single week. A great celebration. Great celebration because God is speaking a blessing over us, not trying to give us a beating every Sunday. And declared a public festival and holiday, and many of the people in the land became Jews themselves. That, that, I think that's insane. Came Jews themselves, for they feared what the Jews might do for 
to them. In other words, this was the thing. This was a movement because they went from condemnation to celebration. And I think that's what we as a church, the people of Christ, need to understand is that you are not what the enemy has said about you. You are not what other people have said about you. You are not what the curses that they have spoken over you, you, you are not that curse. You are what God says about you. And when it comes to our salvation, God says you are a child of God. You are unconditionally loved. You are automatically accepted into his family, not because of what you've done, but because of what his son Jesus Christ did. We are saved, and because we are saved, we are his. Not only do we have his salvation to celebrate, but we can celebrate his strength. We can celebrate the strength that God in us enables us to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. We have the strength to make it through tough times. We have the strength to overcome. Even when it feels like everything is in pieces, we have the strength to help and encourage each other in the times of pieces. We have the strength because the Holy Spirit lives in us and the Bible says greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And at the end of the day, we have his assurance where he says, I want to bless you. I want to keep you. I want my face shining on you. And I want my favor on you and over you. On you and over you. So listen, here, here's how I'm going to close this. When it comes to the curses that speak, people speak over you, there's, there's nothing I can say to take away the pain of what you feel for what people have said to you. Can't take away how, how, how much you've been wounded how beat down you have felt, how ripped apart and in pieces you have felt because of the words of others. But what? What if? What if we paused and replaced the words of others with the words of Jesus? What if we replaced the words of others with the words of Jesus, where he says, may his favor be upon you and your family and your children and their children for a thousand generations. May he go with you because he is for you and he is not against you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. What if we began to believe the blessing rather than the cursing? What if? What if? I believe it would change our lives. I believe it would change our attitudes. I believe it would change our churches. I believe eventually it would change our nation. It would change the world if we just knew that his favor was on us, that his favor was on us, and we just believed his blessing. What if we really did believe that in his way, in his time, he takes the pieces and he puts them back together? We're going to sing a song called The Blessing Together, and I want you to sing this for yourself, and I want you to sing it for those around you, knowing again that none of us, none of us are trying to do this by ourselves. Let's stand and sing. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lord you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace ah face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give
give you peace. Amen. 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 May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going in your weeping and rejoicing, He is with you, He is with you. Ah, ah.